segment of our show today brought to you in part by CMA Honda of Winchester, also by Modern Realty Results, Larry DeMarco and Company. You can find out more at modernrealtyresults.com today. We are produced by Dylan Bishop and co-hosted with uh, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield and New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. And in our final segment of the program today, we welcome in Senate Chairwoman Amy Grady of Senate uh, Education Chair. Good morning, Amy. Thanks so much for being with us. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me. Congratulations. You made it through another school year. I did. I officially finished up on Thursday. Um, kids came last Tuesday. I don't know who made that schedule for them to have their last day be um, the day after Memorial Day, but we survived. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, going um, to be a tough one to get them in there that Tuesday after Memorial well, Day. Well, I'll tell you, we booked a fun field trip, so uh, everybody came. <laughs> that's a, Where do you teach, Amy? I teach in Mason County. A little, we have a, a little school. Uh, Pre-K through sixth grade, Leon Elementary, and we have about 160 kids um, total. Do you teach multiple subjects or just one? I do. I teach multiple subjects. I'm a fourth grade teacher. Very good. Well, with the school year ending, this is the first full year of incorporating charter schools and we, of course, have the public school system that we, we've had for years. Uh, tell me your thoughts on the feedback you've gotten from a first full year of charter schools and uh, hope scholarship uh, uh, money that uh, also is available to parents and such? Well, I feel like the Hope Scholarship money, we are still kind of, you know, not in the realm of how we have, how that's really been successful, simply because it really didn't get implemented really quickly. You know, there were a lot of issues with it, and there was um, that lawsuit regarding trying to say that it was unconstitutional. Um, from a personal perspective, I've spoken with a lot of people personally who have taken advantage of applying for that to provide their child with I'll even give you an example of students from my small school you know we have students who have been used to going to a small school we have maybe 20 kids per class and that's a high number um, and then when they go into the middle school they go into a larger school and their parents just aren't ready for that so they have utilized applying for that hope scholarship money to send their child to a small private Christian school and um, have been really excited and happy that they've had those opportunities. And I, that's the whole purpose of the Hope Scholarship, was to provide families with opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have those, you know, to provide the education that they feel is best for their child. As a public school teacher, do you have any concerns for the long-term effect on public schools as a result no, of this? I, no, Rob, I really don't. I'll tell you why. Because if, if you're happy with the school your child is in, you're not going to look for other, other options. And that's the thing we have to do is we need to make our public schools so competitive and so good that parents will not feel like they need to pull their child out. They won't feel like they need to go find a better education. There, there's nothing wrong with good, a little bit of good competition, right? Competition makes everybody better. And so if we can, it, I think it's more of a goal for us to say, let's make our public schools a lot better. Let's make our public schools so good that parents won't want to look for other, other options. As the Senate Education Chair, what is the plan? I know some of it's being implemented now for making public schools better and more competitive. You know, we passed we passed a bill this session um, that was titled the Third Grade Third Grade Success Act. I don't know if everybody was familiar with that, but it was um, it's a literacy initiative that affects grades K through three. Um, and we're not trying to say we're not worried about the older grades, but. K-3, we're seeing a lot of deficiencies there, and we modeled this legislation after legislation that was in Mississippi. Mississippi was head-to-head -head with West Virginia, and they implemented this exact type of legislation in 2013, and they are now above average when it comes to the NAEP scores nationally. And they have a lot of the same problems we have when it comes to poverty um, and, you know, low education levels with parents, things like that. And so, you know, Looking at what they did and how successful they were, you don't want to reinvent the wheel on something. You want to look at something and say, well, let's mirror something that's already working, and that's what we did with this. And I am, I'm a firm believer that this will make a big difference. We're not going to see a difference in, you know, like next year. It will be four or five years down the road before we actually see the positive effects and the positive changes that we're going to see from this legislation. Bill Stubblefield. Uh, good morning, Amy. Uh, good morning. Uh, the, uh, the, is there a charter school in Mason County? There is not. Uh, how many charter schools do we have throughout the state now? Well, if you only want to count the brick-and-mortar charter schools, we, we actually have three. Okay. Uh, Two is our, a third one. So it's, it's a little early to, uh, to see what impact the charter schools have on the statewide mm -hmm. educational system. Is that correct? 
Yes, it, okay. yes, it is. It absolutely is because you don't have, you know, you don't have them popping up, and and that's that's also another thing that you want to look at. You don't have them popping up everywhere, all over the state. The the charter schools that we have and that we should have should be in a more populated area where there's a, a larger um, a larger pool of students to to grab from. I guess we should say. Uh, you know, I I would I would say when we were talking about charter charter legislation my little school in leon leon um, in mason county we a lot of times our county had talked about closing our school down just because of the numbers were low um what saves us is the bus ride you know that our students cannot be on the bus for a long period of time um anyway we had talked about wouldn't it be great if we just became a charter school to keep our school open you know you may see little uh little community schools like that are one they want to close down pop up and be charters that would be i think that would be a fantastic idea but right now what we have are mostly in the populated areas where you want more options and people can actually get their their child to school that's an intriguing thought about uh in in rural areas converting mm-hmm. from public school to charter school uh what would be the mechanism for doing that and how would you get funding for it support for it well that and that's just something that's right off the top of my head bill i i haven't really given it a whole lot of thought as to what exactly would go into it but i think that if it came down to it and you had a small community school that was going to be closed i think that would be a viable option for them to look into and you'd have to you'd have to maybe find a business partner that would help you know a lot of times we have businesses that help with schools already um to see if they would help to keep the school open the problem is we have these small community schools that close down, and then what happens to the community? The, the entire community basically is a ghost town, you know, because the, the school is the hub of the community, and, and those are the things you want to keep open. So if that's an option to not have our small schools closed is to allow them to explore the opportunity to be a charter school, I think we should do it, and that's something we should look at in the future. Yeah, it's interesting we having this conversation today. I was watching a documentary last night uh, on North uh, North uh, Branch, I think, or North Fork, I guess, the, the school that had such a phenomenal basketball program in the uh, 1970s, 1980s, and the school was closed down, and the devastating impact it had on the community as a whole. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it does. And any time you see those small schools closed down, you know, think about the school. People have like little craft fairs there. They'll have community events there. They hold they hold uh, any kind of social gathering. Um, they hold fundraisers and things for uh, individuals in the community that may be going through um, a hard time. And and when the school closes down, you don't have those opportunities or those things available. And it does it does really hinder the community members, and it really does kind of make the, the the community fall flat. And to me, I think it's important to keep our small com- community schools open because. That is what makes West Virginia so great are our little communities and our little small communities. And small schools mean smaller class sizes, and smaller class sizes means more personalized instruction, and kids will do better. But yeah. hi, This is John Gilstrap. Uh, good morning. How, how do we balance that against the critical shortage of teachers? In- that's, that's, that's a whole different issue, John. <laughs> well, no, I mean, they're directly um, you- tied together. Well, I mean, what I'm talking about with the, the shortage of teachers in general um, are you discuss, talking about, like, the shortage of teachers? Are you thinking, like, closing down schools would help put teachers in a different building so that everybody's in one building? Or how no, I'm just thinking if, if, if we're going to have a lot of smaller schools with smaller classes, smaller classes, you've got to have teachers for each of the smaller classes. So mm-hmm. it takes one teacher to have 40 kids. It takes two teachers to have two classes of 20. So, uh, well, right. Right now, we have the smaller schools that are already open and the classrooms are already filled. Um, I'm not proposing opening more. You know, I'm just proposing don't close those down to consolidate. Consolidate. Um, consolidation should never be the, the idea. What I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not proposing we open a new school in every community and then we would have to find teachers. You're exactly right. But the ones that are already open and are thriving, um, trying to keep them afloat and keep them open is, is important. And... <laughs> I don't know if this is shifting gears or not, probably a little bit. As the chair of the Senate Education Committee, your the the overall performance of schools in West Virginia mm-hmm. is is something less than impressive. And yeah. in in your opening comments or early on in the interview, you know, if we make public schools competitive and great, then you know everything is is the train gets back on the tracks. How do we do that? I mean, is the poor performance a function of the curriculum? Is it a function of the teachers? Is it the function of two big classes? Or is it a function of the, um, 
I don't know, for lack of a better term, the, the upbringing of the kids, a family issue, societal issues that are, are keeping the test scores down? Everything that you just said, everything you said plays a part in the performance of our schools. One thing that I can tell you, not as an education chairwoman, but as a teacher in a, in a rural area, in a Title I school, which is an impoverished area, um, is that the lack of parental involvement and the lack of um, a value of education. So meaning that parents maybe had a poor experience when they were in high school or in school, so they don't get into, as involved in their, in their child's education. Um, a lot of times it is well, you do that at school, and if and, and there's no educating happening at home, you know, that it's something you do at school and only at school. And I can remember growing up, you know, you did, you also did practice at home, practice my multiplication facts. I practiced different things to get better at things at home with my parents, but that doesn't really happen as much anymore. And it's really, it's, and I think it's a combination of things. It's the way society has shifted, but it's also parents are busier. You know, things are having parents, we have parents that are working um, extra jobs. Parents, kids are involved in a lot of after-school activities, a lot of sports, so, so they're not home as much. I think it's not that parents don't love their kids, but I think that it's a combination of things. And a lot of things that you just said, we are still 48th. And I've been an education chairwoman since September, and I made it my goal to say we are going to see what we can do to improve public education. The first step is that Third Grade Success Act, where we are implementing literacy in kindergarten through third grade. We're using the science of reading to make sure that literacy that a literacy initiative and that reading is taught in a scientifically proven way. Um, I don't think it's that teachers don't do a good job. I think that there's a lot of things with curriculum and different things that uh, people aren't using it the way they should in some ways. Uh, there's so many different different factions. So I want to say there are, there are pockets of places in West Virginia that are doing it really well, and then there are places that aren't. And we've got to focus on those places that are doing it really well and kind of mirror that. We can't just say, well, you know, I don't have time to do that. We have to find things that are working and actually do that, no matter if it takes the extra work, no matter if it takes the extra money. Our kids are worth it. So on the Third Grade Success Act, is there a consequence for either the child or the teacher or the school if, in fact, the, the, the goals are not met, do they not progress past third grade? Or Yes. Yes. So this, this works from kindergarten through third grade. On, and um, in kindergarten, if they don't meet certain goals, they should be receiving interventions, which is a fancy word for tutoring, in, in school tutoring that targets specific goals. And in first grade, the same thing. Second grade, the same thing. And by third grade, what, what Mississippi does is what, what we should be implementing soon with these kindergartners that are coming in this year, by the time they get to third grade, we should see the difference. Um, is they, they give an assessment at the beginning of third grade. It's like it's called a gateway test uh, to see that they have, they don't have any deficiencies from kindergarten, first or second grade, and that they can go into third grade um, ready to learn third grade materials and third grade standards. And if they don't pass that gateway test, then that teacher looks and sees what those interventions that they need to provide in that third grade year. And at the end of the year, that child tests again. And if they don't pass it, there are a lot of different things that you look at. Um, but most of the time, in some cases, the child is held back and does not move on from third grade. Now, as for holding teachers accountable, our evaluation system in West Virginia is, is too um, subjective. And we really, really have to change that so that we can evaluate teachers in a more effective way instead of it being based on the administrator's viewpoint, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so that's something we're going to work on in this next legislative session is seeing how we can change that evaluation system. Senator, let me go back to charter schools for, uh, for a couple of minutes. Uh, you made a point that uh, the teaching, uh, the education of our students, of our children, is far and away the most important thing. The charter school debate unfortunately became very politicized. And yeah. the charter schools were, you were very supportive or they were viewed as villains. Uh, we need to get past that. Uh, fortunately, yeah. I've not heard as much political debate about charter schools recently. But how do we get by this? Uh, how do we get to the main issue of putting the education of the students first, regardless of the mechanism? Well, I think but what you said with it being politicized in the beginning, because no, we're really bad in West Virginia, and you guys will probably agree, about not wanting change. You know, and but once the change happens and you see that, that it wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be or nothing happened that you feared would happen, then you kind of people kind of accept it. And that's what happens has happened with charter schools, I think, is in the beginning we had all these 
horror stories about these charter schools in Chicago and New York that that failed because they were for profit, you know, which is not what we were doing in West Virginia anyway. But you have all these people with bits and pieces of information and bits and pieces of facts, um, and they start to spread rumors that aren't true. But once they have been implemented and show that, you know, it's just another option for our students to get what they need, then I think that people will be more accepting. And that's why it's died down a little bit is because they've seen this isn't robbing the public school system of funds. You know what I mean? It is just providing more opportunities, which other states have. You know, we can remain at number 48 by doing things the same way over and over and over again. Or we can start to implement changes and try to see if we can change things in West Virginia for a positive, but we're going to have to take some chances, and that includes charter schools and different things like that. And I think people just have to open their minds. Well, the hysteria over charter schools in this state was a bit on the edge of reason, I, I think. And I'm a big proponent of public schools. I went to public school. My kids went to public schools. We got fine educations, uh, and uh, still, nevertheless, I, I, I was for charter schools. I, I don't see a valid reason to oppose charter schools just because, well, we just don't do that here. Uh, that's just not a valid reason to oppose something. But it became, excuse me, it became more politicized. It totally got it, politicized. It was it, uh, associated with a, uh, with a political party and the disregarded the merits. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I don't disagree with that at all, so- Bill. What I try to what I try to tell people when they talk about charter schools and how they're terrible is, you know, as a public school teacher, I know that we are constantly being told those are low kids. We've got to really work hard to bring them up. We've really got to work hard to bring them up. And those middle kids, we've got to bring them up so that they can pass. But you know who gets left behind a lot of times? Our high kids, our kids that are going to be our doctors, our kids that are going to be our engineers. Because a lot of times teachers focus so much on those low kids and bringing them up to grade level that those higher kids get left behind in a way that they don't know how to push them. So they, they remain high, but they don't, they don't get higher, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And so I mentioned to people that what if we had a charter school that was a science-based charter school, that where we could send those high-level learners and they could really be geared towards engineering or towards medical, you know, some sort of medical profession. And um, that, that could be so helpful. Or a school for the arts. You know, you have a kid who's very talented in the arts, and you could have a school for the arts where those children could go and, and they could use that. You know, they may not be performing well in public schools because they're bored or it's something that's not interesting to them. But if you had a school for the arts that you could put them in, like a lot of big cities do, maybe they would thrive. Those are the things we need to look at and say that they could be a positive effect on those kids that are being left behind because they're already above grade level or on grade level. Senator, I cannot agree with you more. I think that's a marvelous way we should go. How do we pay for that, though? How can that be afforded? Well, how do we pay for anything? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I mean, honestly, we've got to, um, we have to prioritize. And that's, I think that's something that um, we've not done. And I don't want to go into big details, but I think that's something we haven't really done in the past is prioritize education in a way. Plus, I, maybe that's not fair to say, honestly, because we do have, we do spend a lot on education, but in the wrong ways, if that makes sense. You know, just throwing money at something and not seeing a return on investment is something that we're really bad about. We're really bad about giving um, out money to, the, let's say, to the department and saying, well, this is what it's being used for, but we don't have any data that shows what it was used for is, is, is working or helping our students. Um, we are top-heavy in administration when it comes to the Department of Education and also in our county levels. We are top-heavy, and How- too much money is spent on county board offices and not enough in the classroom, and that will make a big difference too. How do you rectify that problem? Well, I started with that last last session trying to find a way that we could come up with a new formula to make sure that uh, based on, so with school nurses, for instance, we have 12, every 1,200 students, each county gets one school nurse, which is kind of crazy because that, that means a school nurse could be covering four schools in a county. Um, but anyway, when you look at that, if you did that with administrators, you know, for every so many students, you get this many administrators at the board office that's paid for by the state. And you can't, obviously, you can't do anything about federal funds because the federal money does pay for some positions there, too. But you could control the money that the state gives you and how many administrative positions you can pay for there. That, that's a different type of formula we would have to look at. It, I thought it would be kind of an easy task. I started looking at that back in November, worked on it throughout the session, and it, it's such a just the numbers are so crazy. No other state really does it that way, so we're trying to figure out 
how we can really do that effectively. And that's a goal for this next session is and, to try to figure out an admin ratio. And the reality is, I think, that, that education in any community is the key to growth. We have a parade of people come through the studio and we talk to them on the phone about bringing industry and bringing growth to West Virginia. And I think that's a wonderful goal. But until you can tell young families that your children are going to get a, a fine uh, public education, not 48th, but you know at least somewhere in the middle of the pack, if, if not, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, until you can present, until the state or community can present that as a fact, we're not going to attract the people to man the industries that we're trying to build here. So, you know, I, your, your work and, your, you know, I, I don't know, you're wrestling a snake and not, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to wrangle. Um, I wish yeah. you nothing but, but great luck, but it's. Uh, Amy, I got 30 seconds. Final word is yours. Yes, Final word is mine. Well, I just want to say that if uh, I'm a very stubborn woman, so if anybody will, cut the head off of the snake and try to wrangle the snake, so to speak, that'll be me. And I will not give up until I make sure that we are climbing. We, we're at 48 now, but, you know, we don't want to go any lower, but we definitely can go up. And that's my goal as education chairwoman is to try to give a perspective of a mom. I have three kids in public education and as a public educator to say these are the things we need to help our kids. Amy, thanks so much for your time today. As always, greatly appreciated. Thank you, Rob. You all have a good day. Thank you. You too. Senator Amy Grady, the education chair out of the Senate in the state of West Virginia. Final minute of the program coming up.